Catherine Bigelow's Detroit is pure social justice warrior propaganda. I'll explain that in the following review. In a nutshell, it's a big steaming pile of horse <laughs> Catherine Bigelow's Detroit Oscar bait, uh, it's like the term Oscar bait was created for this film, not Gay Jared, yours truly, and actually Pops Crowder went to go see the film uh, today, mm -hmm. and we'll give you a full review here in, in, in a minute, the good, the bad, and the ugly. He actually, I should say this, was raised in Detroit during the riots, mm -hmm. so uh, that's why he's here, otherwise <laughs> you know, we, we, we keep him hidden. Let me say this right on the outset. It is textbook propaganda. Not gay, Jerry, bring up the textbook definition of propaganda. And what I mean by that is they, they deliberately spread misinformation to malign a specific group of people, as you see through the, the, uh, the definition. Now, 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 who's that group? Okay, we'll, we'll get into whether it's just a good movie standalone, and then we'll get into what is accurate, what they got right, and what they got wrong. They got nearly all of it wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, let's now, do you, when you say the word literally, are you throwing that out there to mean like, like figuratively? No, 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 no. I'm throwing it out to mean literally. <laughs> Nearly everything wrong. Um, so let's see some other reviews right off the bat. Let's see what they have to say. A couple of them. From ABC News, this was America. You think this is still America. Wall Street Journal, dramatically relentless and emotionally shattering. It brings n news from a turbulent past that casts <laughs> A baleful light on America's troubled present. New York Times, just the headline review. In Detroit, black lives caught in a prehistory of the alt-right. Okay, now when I say propaganda to malign a specific group of people, who is it? Not only police officers, which we'll get to, but specifically, yeah, white people. Now, I'm not turning this into a race war, but Catherine Bigelow is. She actually said, what better way to use your white privilege, unironically use the term white privilege, than to undermine it. That is the goal of this film. Uh, okay, first off, before we get to the, the, the message where they got right or wrong, did you like it? Did you think it was well done? It was a well done film, especially from a cine cinematography standpoint. Yeah. It looked good. It felt nice. That was about all I could say for it. I mean, she loves it, her it, shaky it, cam, She though. loves the shaky cam. She just shakes the hell out of that cam. Did, what did you think, Pops? Uh, you know, plenty of grit. It sure looked, it looked authentic when, when we saw the actual reel from the city, but it was a whole different tenor and tone when they went to the... The actual film stock. This is true. I didn't really like it that much. I, I thought The Hurt Locker was good. I thought Zero Dark Thirty was... They're all a bit too long. So yeah. if you're not a huge fan of Bigelow's previous films with the, the jarring, shaky cam and uh, always a little bit too long, just a little bit self-indulgent, this isn't going to change your mind from that perspective. Certainly not a pleasant watch. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't, it's, wouldn't see it twice. No. <laughs> pretty bleak, uh, which is, I think, by design. Again, used to push the propaganda. So yeah. he, here's where they what they got wrong. Right off the bat, let's talk about the very first frames of the film. There's this animation where it talks about uh, black Americans coming from the South, promises of jobs to the North and the Midwest, Detroit. And then somewhere in there, uh, there are a couple things. They say the myth, equal opportunity was a myth. It was a lie. And uh, that one is completely false because as a matter of fact, they couldn't have picked a worse example. Detroit, if you actually look at the statistics, black Median family incomes were about 95% that. That's just comparing the median income of black families to white families. Now, that's not job for job, so we're not talking about pay, like wage gap statistics, but that matters because that gives you an idea as to the class. Was there an underclass in Detroit, black families? No, 95% of the standard income of white families, and then about three to 4% unemployment. Now, after the riots, all of that skyrocketed, right? And it disproportionately hurt black people. Black people were disproportionately killed by black people. Black people disproportionately lost home ownership. Their property values went down. But the idea that it was a myth, no, you could only make that claim after the riots. And then another thing in that, I think it's in that first intro, they talk about how the white fled to the suburbs mm -hmm. and blacks were restricted to specific areas of the city. And it's a little sleight of hand because it moves from it like as though it was policy. Now you lived in Detroit. Was there a policy where you, you, you stay in this block? Absolutely. The, the only people I knew of that were restricted... Wait, wait, you just said... <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Okay. There was a policy. The policy of restriction was police and firemen could not leave the city of Detroit. Oh, I see what they you They had to Twist. live in the environment <laughs> and the environs of the city. Those were the only people who were restricted to it. And to that's, that's where you lived. I that lived area, because you were right on that outer ring. In that ring. little notch where all those people lived. Well, your, uh, your best friend's dad, mm -hmm. Mr. Petroni, was a Several cop. friends' uh, fathers were, were policemen. Yeah, they were policemen. Now, t mm -hmm. tell people who don't know, you were raised, again, in Detroit, what, yes. what you want. Well, first off, here's something that's important, because they, they, they use kind of the crux of this is one of the main characters uses, spoiler alert, by the mm -hmm. way, for people who haven't watched it, uses a starter pistol, and he's shooting repeatedly at police officers with a starter pistol, so they think it's sniper fire. Now, they refer to this as a 
toy gun. It's a toy gun. Yeah. <laughs> it's a squirt gun. It's well, a super It's a starter gun. pistol, so they can actually see flash and ga- gun yeah. sounds. Now, what, so, so it's used to diminish the idea of sniper fire, that they were just trigger-happy police officers. By the way, police officers, horrible. We'll get to the individual, the, uh, the yes. motel case. All of us agree, terrible, abuse of the law, fine. But the context matters. What did your, fa- your father was in the Air Force. What did he do? During the Detroit riots. At that time, he led some uh, Air National Guard people that did uh, reconnaissance flights over the city of Detroit in an RF-84, which was a plane that was designed to take photos from high altitude and high def photos at that time um, for sniper fire and, and, and fires and activity in the city. He ran reconnaissance for <laughs> snipers on rooftops. And didn't you watch tanks go down? Uh... Down Kadju Road on the way to I-94. We uh, sat, my brother and I, uh, your Uncle Dean, my older brother, sat on the mailbox and watched them parade by. Tanks, armored uh, uh, personnel carriers, uh, yeah. jeeps. It was a war zone. Yeah, it was a war zone. The city was a war zone. I mean, you had, you had hundreds of... But that of... wasn't just National Guard. That was uh, uh, 82nd Airborne, 101st Airborne. Yeah. Uh, current military. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was a big deal. And that's important to note because um, there's this film, and this is what's dangerous, is it intercuts real footage of Detroit with fake footage. Now, mm-hmm. it focuses, is it the uh, the Algier Motel? Algier, yep. Algier Motel. Focus on that, and that is a very specific story they choose where there are examples of police brutality. They weren't uh, charged. Uh, they weren't convicted if you look at the, the, the court documents, and they, they omit quite a few facts. But it is interesting because this is, again, where the propaganda comes in. So they start with misinformation. They ignore contextually the Detroit riots. Uh, and I think that's important because if you actually looked at Detroit riots, you could say, oh, well, this could be a great learning tool. Mm-hmm. It hurt everybody. No one benefited. And it, most of all, hurt black families in Detroit, black people looting and killing black people, it really hurt the black community. Instead, when you make it about white privilege, you take something that could actually be uniting, where we could avoid these conflicts in the future, and people are saying, well, it's more relevant because it's more racist now than ever. Right. Didn't we just have a black president? Was I, was that like a, was it daydreaming for eight years? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I wish, I wish that were the case, Stephen. Okay, I so let's go back. That. So there's, there's real footage intercut with fake footage, which I think is I- I- important because the fake footage, so the sh- footage is shot, and it's shot to look like real footage, shows people really scared, like kids like ste- yeah. looting groceries. Right. Yeah. And then it cuts to the real footage, and it's a bunch of people who are stoned and cocky. I get in the TV, <laughs> walking out, <laughs> kicking in windows. It shows footage, fake footage, of a, of, of a white woman stealing a television set. Yeah. And then real footage of gang members, again, lighting things. It's like you couldn't find one instance, you're putting it in a fake footage, you couldn't find one instance of just the old, the old white lady carrying a TV set, not one. <laughs> and so, she wasn't going to keep possession of that TV for no, long. No, she wasn't going to. No, <laughs> no. no, different laws. I'll tell you. What do you think would happen? <laughs> so, um, you know, what, what, what was the reality? Because they really, that, for people who don't realize, some people won't know what is fake and what is real. Again, because the yeah. shaky cam. Well, what you, what you notice in the footage, the, the actual footage versus the, movie, the, the film, is there's a power difference in the actual footage, who has the power? It's the protesters, it's the rioters. Yeah. And in the real footage, they make, or in the film footage, they make it look as though the cops have all the power. Right. And these people are the downtrodden, the beaten down, the, the fearful, and the, the real, uh, the actual footage belies all of that. I mean, these people are in control. Yeah, well, and, the, wor- and the, the people who would be first targeted by snipers, the people who would have it the worst of all would be black police officers sure. in Detroit. That's what they, they skim That's over right. that at the end. Uh, I forgot the name of the, the actor from Star Wars. John Boyega. Yeah, John Boyega. He plays a black security yeah. guard. Oh, that's who that is. Okay. Remember, he's being charged. Mm-hmm. He's, be, he's on trial with these white guys. Yep. And they make it seem like he's disgusted with these white cops who are grand, absolutely disgusting from what we know. Um, but uh, they skim over. He fled the, to the suburbs, <laughs> suburbs immediately afterward due to I death threats. They were, I thought like, they were well, restricted. Hold on a second. He's a black. He's a black security. What, was it the cops sending him death threats? You know this. Yeah. Black police officers in Detroit had to drive home in unmarked cars. Oh, it was terrible. Sure, they, you know the old, all the old terms, Uncle Tom, and and uh, these guys. These guys had a lot. Had a tough slog for sure, and they increased hiring of black cops exponentially right after the riots. Right. Yeah. It was policy. Right. And put probably put them in a lot of danger as mm-hmm. well. Absolutely. Um, so we, we had a couple of things here that uh, that, that really <laughs> struck me. So they here's what matters. They focus on one Algier, uh, the motel. Right now, you watch this and you want to ring these cops, the eyebrows, white guy, oh, his oh neck, yeah. because it, it is looks it's like wrong. Up Sid. Yes. For, again, spoiler alert. <laughs> he looks like Sid from a face a lot of punch story. appeal. As yeah. You say. Yeah. And you watch it, it, but the thing is, and if you look at the reviews, they say one can hardly watch these without seeing the faces of Trayvon Martin oh. or uh, Michael Brown. Well, hold on a second. 
Are you trying to say these people weren't innocent and shot? Like Michael Brown, because hands up, don't shoot was a lie. And unfortunately, because of the lies from the left so consistently, it makes me watch this film and go, wait a second, wait a second, is that true? So in this film, they make it seem again as though they remove the context. Now, if you look at Detroit riots, if you look at Detroit 1960, to this very hour, it's pretty damning. <laughs> it's it's an all Democrat city, That's true. all black city commission, all you know. It's it's all Democrat, all black, all the time. So if you if you look at if you have to look, you're gonna look about checking your privilege. You want to look at systemic problems and corruption with Detroit. It's so clear. Sure. So the deal is okay. Uh, all right, you can just see the wheels turning with Cat with Bigelow. Okay, we can't do it because Detroit. Then everyone's going to see yeah. de Democratic mayor since 1961. They're going to see black city commissioner. Worse now than ever. Yeah, worse now than ever. Okay, let's not, let's okay. Let's take one example that's clearly a really bad story of bad police officers, police brutality, people executed. Okay, so we can take that. Let's take this. Ah, crap. It's not necessarily black and white. Half of these kids have a rap sheet a mile long. Uh, we're gonna have to, let's address it in court later where they ask him if he was ever arrested. No, no, by the way, guy was arrested. Some of these people were arrested Mo Motion like to strike times. that question. Yeah, yeah. motion to strike <laughs> that question. Right. Not so relevant at all. Assaulted a teacher, yeah. <laughs> B and E. And then the, the two white girl characters in the film, I find it so funny. So this is what they do. This whole film is designed, if you look at it, they'll say, hashtag not all cops, I back the blue. But this whole film is designed to create one excuse of, after another, just, I never did anything, he planted it. All <laughs> cops are planting uh, weapons, all cops are corrupt. It's this wall of blue, it happens sometimes. But if you look at what happened in this film, cops have been charged for far less. It's true. So immediately oh, yeah. it begs some questions. And they try to make it seem as though all cops are racist because there are two white girls there. And what are you doing sleeping with these N-words? Are you a prostitute? I would never, sir. Well, in reality, <laughs> turns out they were prostitutes. Right. <laughs> if you actually look at the case, they had a long criminal history, police records of being prostitutes, which is not included in the film. But those are fabricated, though. <laughs> yeah, those are those are these are white girls, by yeah. the way. So none of this justifies the behavior of the police. But again, this, this is... And what I just find important, and this is why I wanted to have you on the show to talk about your experiences in Detroit. Ignore the whole history, ignore the whole context of the city, Detroit 1962 today. Focus on one, and what will they say? Well, because their story needs to be told. So we're gonna selectively tell this story which vilifies police officers, and as Bigelow says, undermines white privilege, brings it to the forefront. We're gonna pick this one story, okay. What about picking the one story of the teacher who was assaulted by these people in this one story? Everyone has a story. You can take anyone's story, make it bleak and harrowing, and you, you could certainly do it from the other side with the Detroit riots. And statistically, measure it's undeniable that the Detroit riots were the result of leftist policies and racially incited violence and hatred from the left. That's right. I don't. I don't know uh, what the goal of the film is. I don't know what they're trying to. It doesn't certainly doesn't help race relations. Does it create an excuse? Does it create more more fear, more tension? Um, I don't know. It's just uh, I, I don't see where it was going. That's, you know, that's a good point, because it's about undermining white privilege, right? That's what mm. they say is, so, so that starts with the premise of white privilege. And that starts with the premise of we need to undermine it, uh, we need to undermine it meaning white people need to feel guilty. And they couldn't pick a worse example. I never remember feeling in control when I lived in Detroit. I remember feeling, <laughs> I, I never really did. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was going into the city to oppress. You know, we were told to lock our doors and mind our own business and roll the stoplights because it was extremely dangerous. Uh, that, that was the time. Just, uh, Hence, they still do that. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. Not. But there's nobody left to kill. The population is less than you know a third of what it was when I grew up there. But uh, I never felt in control of anything. I never saw that. I always, I saw the other side of it. Uh, what the actual footage showed, which was the bullying and the mocking and the uh, really enjoying the violence. And I grew up thinking that's what it was like as you went further into the city. I think you know you ask the question, but I think it's a very it's it's a good point. What is the goal of the film? And I think the goal of the film. Oh, you, okay, you were raised in Detroit, right? The race riots in Detroit. Okay. How would you say race relations are today in 2017? Worse. Say so they're worse today? Worse today. Across the country? But we're worse today because of what's been ginned up uh, in these last eight years. You think Everything so? has been seen through the lens of race and class and gender, and it's, uh, it's really getting tough. Now, is there systemic racism? No, it's gone. There is no impediment to your progress anymore in education, in media, uh, anywhere. Um, now, are there individual racists like we saw in the film? Sure, on both sides. Yeah. But I don't think there's any institutionalized racism. I think in the 60s it did. They could make a case for, yeah. Yeah, for, for a, an uphill struggle. Sure. In the 60s they could. The, the worst example would be Detroit. Yeah, right. because you had, you had black people and white and people. And all the Democrats that a, were against the civil rights movement. Right. And it was it was part of the Model Cities program. For people who don't know, we have two videos in Detroit, uh, Naki, Jared, and I have done in the past, where we have all of the statistics regarding Detroit, their unemployment, what's occurring, yeah. kicked out of the car in there. 
Um, you know, it Model Cities chilling. program. Detroit was doing so well, and there was, you know, both black and white people. They were. It was a mixed class. This idea mm -hmm. that it's poverty. There wasn't a black underclass in Detroit until after the riots. It disproportionately harmed black Americans, which is why I, I would think if, we're re if our goal is really to make progress, if our goal is, if the film's goal was to make people rethink their 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 positions or to make people. Uh, um, to unite people across the racial divide, to actually educate people in ways they could improve their neighborhoods, and specifically to benefit the black community it claims to serve, mm -hmm. they should address the fallout of the Detroit riots and the policies thereof and say, hey, this is the cautionary tale. Don't, don't do that. That's the opposite of what we want to do. You had some notes written down. You don't want the film. <clears throat> most of my notes. Yeah, you the notes. Most of my notes are not great. Uh, I, I think we, we talked about there was a scene at the very beginning. It was like an animated kind of. Well, that was really bad. And, and to go back to something we talked about before, I, I was thinking, okay, is Catherine Bigelow really that bad? Like, I, I didn't really see it really clearly in the Hurt Locker or even in Serial <laughs> Dark 30. Like, it was kind of soft propaganda. And then you're like, no, she's gotten bad. I'm like, okay, we'll see. The, the first seconds, I was like. Oh, yeah, it opened. It opens. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to, I wanted to walk out like just it was so so bad. Um, the very first phrase is about the cotton fields. Cotton fields, like yeah, it opens up like could you? And could then you the fall, the lie of equal opportunity yeah. in Detroit. Yeah, yeah, the liquor license thing was something we talked oh, about. Oh, that's right, that's funny. Oh, that's yes. fu they're they're busting a speakeasy. A speakeasy, right? So again, this whole thing is again, if it sounds like we're just or this sounds right. No, the whole film is designed to incite basically. Uh, 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 an ideological race war. Mm -hmm. That's really what this film is designed. That's what Catherine Bigelow is seeking to do. Do you think you're going to make anyone less racist with this film? You're probably going to get some kid from junior high, watch this in Detroit, and go, "I knew it," Call and then it. go yeah. and just like one of the, just like Charles Cooper, one of the guys in here that they omitted from the film, assault the teacher. Right? That happened mm -hmm. in your school. Oh, all the time. Teacher sure. got stabbed. Sure. We had a, a an assistant principal beaten within the first week of the of the busing. Did the she come back? Week. She did. She was tough old bird. <laughs> Mrs. Mrs. Baird. Mrs. Baird. I remember yeah. she a stocky gal, but she, she got ganged up on. They took her down. Right, because of right after all of these these incidents, they put you on a bus together and said... Then. It was it was the year after, I think. This is, they, it's time for healing, kids. That's it. Bring the healing. And they sent, they sent black kids to white neighborhoods mm -hmm. whose parents were often police officers who they did not like. And, um, and that's the schools they came to. You got beaten up quite a bit. Oh, we had a lot of, a lot of trouble. In, in, no, in you that specifically. Time. Oh, yeah. Well, you took yours. In, in, the early, in, the early, <laughs> in the early years, I took mine early and often. Yeah, I did. I really did. <laughs> but uh, but it, it, did, it didn't seem to last too long. It seems like that experiment failed so miserably that they dialed it back pretty quick. I think it was two or three years in that it was done. Well, and that's what's so important is they say, like, they were restricted. This is the idea. There's white flight, and they were restricted to these areas, mm -hmm. though it was policy. There was no policy that blacks were restricted to an area of Detroit. And, again, the same level of income and wealth, the wealthiest city in the country at that point. So that is... In all, it, 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 it's 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 a bald faced lie. Go yeah, ahead. yeah. And, and the whole opening monologue, people need to know. People need to be aware of the sleight of hand that goes on there because it, it is pivotal and critical to Catherine Bigelow's entire narrative. Yes, they set it up that that these people were forced here. They even make it sound like they moved to the north uh, for they were like tricked into moving to the north for the factory yeah. jobs. Yeah, right. Yeah, so they move there. And they are cornered. They are moved in these neighborhoods. They are restricted, restricted to these neighborhoods. Yeah, restricted. According to Catherine, Bill, restricted. When you hear restricted, you think yeah. someone else is restricting them. No, there was no law. And they have to set this all, all these things up. They have to lean it all into the favor of these poor black people had no other choice. What did you expect them to do? So they, right. they can dismiss all the actions of the riots that follow. So you have to be like, ah, well, I guess what else do we expect? And it's the racism of low expectations at play. Yeah, we, right we, all very agree. First we, we all agree. If we if we were to start a speakeasy and sell alcohol in the middle of the night illegally, yeah, that's, that's or if I were to like, or if I were to shoot a starter pistol out an upstairs window at cops repeatedly, business repeatedly be picking up shortly. I mean, yeah. I don't care who you are. Yeah, and they refer to it as a toy gun. Like a starter gun. pistol is not a toy <laughs> gun. <laughs> it, it, it sounds it like a, a real gun. Flash and it sounds exactly. That's why it works to start cases. Yeah. <laughs> some may say that was the purpose of him firing out the window. Yeah, some may say he might have said, "I'm gonna teach these." Police a lesson. Bang, 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 bang. By the way, oh, no, at no point, spoiler alert, at no point in this film when these people are lined up, they all lie. They say, did anyone have, no one has a gun that we know of, officer. Literally, it, the whole situation, officers are terrible, okay? Yeah. We get it, not us using the yeah. officers. But if I'm in there, I go, oh, 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 officer, yeah, you saw that flash? It's that guy who now is, is dead on the floor. Granted, you screwed up there, but he <laughs> did shoot the starter pistol at you repeatedly from the top floor. Mm. Starter pistol, top floor, right there, he was shooting at you. I get it, because you've had sniper fire. Starter pistol, top floor, I'm gonna be on my way. <laughs> and get my lawyer. It could have stopped the whole thing. The whole thing. But because of this culture of no yeah. snitches, yeah. they don't talk to the police, 
Well, listen, police are getting sniper fire. The liquor thing, that was what set off the riots in here. They, they go, uh, the guy says, I didn't do nothing. Hey, you have no right to treat us this way. And the guy goes, listen, you don't have a liquor license. It's a speakeasy. Gerald has jumped through hoops to get a winery <laughs> license, and he does wine tasting. It's true. To make sure, like, they, again, it, it presumes that police officers only target people in one area of town of a specific race. Yeah. If you're a white guy in the suburbs, if you're a white guy who runs a franchise Applebee's and you don't renew your liquor license, you're going out in a paddy wagon. Mm -hmm. And it's the presumption from Catherine Bigelow, white privilege immediately. Detroit is the result of a white systemic racism, I guess, but they can't point to it. Therefore, let's focus on this story and, and, and malign police officers and people who had no involvement with it. And that's why I say it is, it is head to toe proactive propaganda. And remember, uh, the paddy wagons were named after all those Irish that they hauled out named Patty in the old days when they were discriminated against, one might say. It's true. It's true. <laughs> they did, but those drunken mix, uh, well, they had it coming. Wait, is mix Scottish or Irish? I get Scot it's Scottish. Scottish? Is mix Scottish? Yeah. I don't know. It goes for both, I think. I don't know, but you get my point. Okay, anything else that we missed? I think film? something uh, that I thought about, a lot about was you mentioned this could have been a learning opportunity for people to say, look, mm -hmm. there's a lot of screw-ups. Yes. A lot of things that could have been learned from all sides of it. And I think one of the things that is forgo often forgotten about that we saw blatantly in the movie was they are quick to showcase the culture of silence that exists within the police department. Which within, is a problem. Which is a, pro yeah. which is a huge problem. And yes, these people should be held to a much higher standard than your everyday citizens. But there is also a culture of si silence that happens that these guys, they had so many opportunities to say, yeah, that guy right there, the one he just shot, yeah, he was firing out the window trying to scare you all. Yeah. Not my idea. With very I little pulled risk out. Because yeah. he was the dead guy on the floor. He was the dead guy on the floor. <laughs> like, what, are you, what are you hiding for? Who are you saving? Right. Who are you protecting? <laughs> Throw him under the bus. Yeah, I know. What's funny is, again, spoiler alert, they leave and walk out of the room because this guy has a starter pistol and fake shoots his friends. And the girls are like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. And they're like, come on. It was just a joke. The guy was clearly a dick using his starter pistol to scare people, trying. He, he literally used it to trick people. And it was convincing enough to be a real gun. Yes. <laughs> That's when it starts. And they call it a toy gun toy in gun. the film. Now, the starter pistol was never recovered, but again, if you look at the testimony, that's what it was. It was a starter pistol. That's what started this. And and, and multiple times is important. It wasn't like, bang, oh, oh no. gosh, screw up. It oh, was he emptied the bang, starter and then they shoot out the street lights because they're going, where's the sniper fire coming from? <laughs> bang, 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 yeah. bang, bang. They see the flash coming from the super soaker on the third floor, <laughs> the Alger Motel, and the gunshots, and they storm it. Hor mistakes all around. But again, what's important is they're telling one story here. Okay, I understand that. You're, you're, you're a filmmaker. Um, but they're, they're, they try to provide context in, in a way, like you said, that has nothing to do with Detroit. Mm -hmm. The cotton fields, moving north, World War II. At no point do they mention the actual direct policies of Detroit to tell a personal story. They don't tell the personal story of the folks these people have assaulted. Uh, the people who were looted, the black people who were looted, or there's a B and E with one of these yeah. gentlemen. They have long, long raps. I'm surprised they didn't start die. with the 1600s in Africa. I'm surprised they didn't start the narrative there, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. just to build their case. <laughs> I know they, start, they started with the cotton fields. They went back pretty then far. Pretty far to talk about the early slave traders, and that doesn't fit the narrative. Maybe shoot, 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 shoot. We have to rewrite yeah, that. That's the yes. same thing. Like with these, pro you know, Catherine Bigelow was like, okay, all these people seem like we can make them squeaky clean, so we can just make the cops. All bad, except for one, mandatory, so we can say hashtag not all cops, but the whole film is vilifying cops. Okay, here we go. And then someone said, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, these two women actually had police records of being prostitutes. Shoot, shoot, shoot. <laughs> all right, um, we'll just say it like in passing. You know what? I know. We'll make the cop racist, and he'll just assume, we'll just, he'll assume that she's a prostitute because she was with a black guy, so we'll, it will make the officers assume the black guy's a pimp and she's a prostitute. We'll never actually say that she's really a prostitute. We'll make it seem like it's a prejudicial judgment. <laughs> So the whole film is propaganda. Again, contextually, I hope people watch this and instead of going out outraged, what I hope happens, and I hope if you watch this review and you, uh, you know someone who doesn't understand the history of Detroit, send them our video, send them this review. Look contextually from 1960, from the 50s actually. Look at black Americans pre-Detroit riots, pre-Lyndon uh, Johnson, pre-model cities, pre-welfare program, all the way go from the 1950s to today. Take all of that context Detroit, all of it, everything. Mayors, city commissions, police commissioners, senators, everything. Every, local state senators or congressional, everyone who would have any direct involvement in determining the course that is Detroit. And then you tell me if this film seems like an accurate representation. Also, I didn't like it. I think you guys liked it more than I did. I just, the shaky cam makes me nauseous. No, I wasn't a fan. Like I said, wouldn't see it again. 
No, I wouldn't no. see it again. No. Not you don't really have a rating system. Pile, pile, I just want to say pile of crap. Pile of crap. Pile of crap. On, on, a, on a filmmaking basis, middle of the road. Middle of the road. On a propaganda basis, pile of crap. Big steaming Big pile steaming. of crap. What would you say? Would you say? I would agree with that. Corn infested? Sure. Okay. Steaming? Sure. All right, that's our review of Catherine Bigelow's Detroit. Uh, Bigelow, you can send your <laughs> lawsuit to Sound Guy Edward. He deals with that now. <laughs> Hey, if you like this clip, you're like most of the internet. You have a short attention span, but it was taken from the full show. You can see it in a box playing next to me. Uh, that's once a week on Thursday's full one and a half hour show, or you can join the Mug Club uh, for the daily show. We have to take some of that off YouTube because they're monitoring us and censoring our words.